So what are baseband's? Well, they're proprietary processors that speak the two through five G protocols, and they're on every phone today. So everyone's pocket has a baseband and uh, is probably communicating with the cell tower right now. Basebands execute binary firmware, which is generated from millions of lines of C. Not necessarily C, but in, in today's day and age, firmware is easy to write in C. So uh, typically, they use a real-time operating system that runs independently from the application processor. So they're effectively in the background, continually processing seller messaging. And previous work has shown that remote over-the-air vulnerabilities do exist and have been exploited in the past. So if we were wanting to go out and figure out if there are additional remote vulnerabilities in our basebands, how would we go about doing that? Well, to, uh, to get thinking about that kind of question, you start to realize there are a lot of challenges in doing so. One is that, in general, finding bugs in these things is very difficult for a couple of reasons. Uh, if you were to set up a fake base station and uh, put a fuzzer there and hit go, um, you'd realize that there's a lot of problems with this approach in that it's slow and it suffers from a lack of instrumentation on the target, which is the baseband running on a physical device. And by instrumentation, I mean crash details and code coverage. Uh, additionally, baseband firmware is proprietary. It is uh, controlled by the manufacturers and it is locked down, so you can't modify it without bypassing signature checking on phones. And for all intents and purposes, they are black boxes. So as a result, some of the industry uh, work that has looked at basebands has been relying heavily on manual analysis. And some um, academic approaches with, which use emulation have uh, automated a bit more, but they haven't gotten past uh, single function fuzzing uh, of decoders. And really, the question we want to ask is, can we do better? Can we do more emulation? And is it even really possible to do this on such a complex target effectively? Well, as, as you sure can imagine, I'm here to talk about our new framework, FirmWire, which is addressing these limitations by building a dynamic analysis platform specifically tailored for baseband firmware. And firmware is unique in that it emulates the firmware as is from the manufacturer, so you can download the firmware, put it in the FirmWire, and then it will emulate it from the boot, early boot stages. It supports multiple platforms, chipsets, and phone models through what we call vendor plugins. Now, vendor plugins contain a couple of uh, key parts, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, currently, we've had added support for the Samsung and MediaTek basebands, and firmware is extensible, so you can extend it to other basebands as they come up in the future um, and as you see fit. It offers, as a, the main testing ability, a, a cross-platform real-time operating system introspection, which allows you to understand the tasks that are running and the protocols they're implementing, and additionally, you're able to inject your own tasks and modify memory to support many dynamic analyses, including fuzzing. Now, since I don't have a whole lot of time, I'm only going to be covering a couple of pieces uh, of the puzzle. One is that I'll be talking about the pattern database we use to help resolve offsets within this binary firmware. And secondarily, I'll be talking about how we were able to add support to new chip for new chipsets using a, a small configuration uh, class. And finally, I'll talk about some of the cool analyses that we did and what we found. So, pattern DB. It's part of the vendor plugin for FirmWire, and we have a unique one for every single manufacturer that we support. Effectively, it boils down to a pattern that is made up of these hex strings. And these hex strings can be fuzzy or exact, but what they really do is when you run them across the bytes of a, a firmware, you're able to then anchor yourself across multiple different firmware versions. So by crafting a specific, specific pattern to find a specific location and um, ensuring that it is stable across multiple changes, you can orient yourself in the firmware even without symbol tables, which manufacturers typically do not provide. Uh, there are some additional post-processing steps that you can do once you've found the offset within the binary, which allow you to then extract some knowledge from the firmware and uh, install things such as hooks. Now, to support Samsung, we had to create 18 patterns, and for MediaTek, nine, because MediaTek uh, did have some symbols already, so we didn't have to create as many, um, but Samsung was completely binary with no symbol information. And yeah, these are really the key part of making firmware portable and scalable, and I'll show the, uh, the scalability a little bit later. To support multiple systems on chips or chipsets, uh, we have a small configuration class, which lets us define peripherals that we can either create custom in a custom way, 
or um, uh, attributes for the specific chipsets. Um, there can be common peripherals for an entire family or a single platform, and then there can be chipset specific peripherals and um, attributes that can be arguments to those peripherals. And a peripheral could be uh, a UART controller, a, a DMA controller, um, anything you'd think of to implement in Verilog or in HDL is a peripheral that we would need a model to be able to properly bring up the baseband's in our emulation environment. So uh, during uh, the development of this paper, we ended up creating and adding support for six different chipsets across uh, about four years of devices. And uh, as you can see in the lines of code, there really uh, isn't a whole lot of lines required to add additional support. And uh, uh, this is good because new chipsets are coming out all the time. So once you've built a vendor plugin and you're able to actually run the firmware that you want to do some analysis on in FirmWire, you want to actually be able to inject your own code and start changing the way it operates and also to inject your own fuzzers. And to do this, we created this thing we call ModKit, which allows you to create a relocatable ELF image from using the target tool chain, like for instance, Samsung uses ARM and uh, MediaTek uses MIPS. With those tool chains, we'll compile a uh, position independent piece of code which we will then map into the memory of the baseband, which is running in as a guest operating system in our emulator. And then this will then be uh, initialized using the existing modem APIs as if we were developers of the firmware itself to then uh, bring up this task. And then this task can start interacting with the baseband from within. And this gives us a lot of advantages because by doing this approach, instead of uh, staying completely outside of the guest using hooks or OS introspection techniques, we're able to uh, have a bit more portability because these APIs for spawning tasks and sending messages are fairly stable, at least in what we've seen so far. So how do we evaluate firmware? And we came up with three questions that we wanted to answer during our evaluation. One is that, can a dynamic analysis platform like this actually aid security testing? And to do this, we did fuzz testing a comparative study against previous work and vulnerability analysis, although for today I'll only really briefly touch on the fuzz testing. The qu second question was to then confirm any findings that we found in our emulator, which as you can imagine, um, you might be wondering how accurate it is. Uh, we were able to confirm our findings using over-the-air testing on using a fake base station. And finally, we wanted to show that firmware is scalable. And we did that by collecting a large corpus of firmware, booting it, and then performing a large-scale vulnerability study. So for question one, uh, to answer the question of can we, use security test, can we do security testing with firmware, uh, we built four fuzzing harnesses and used, co used coverage-guided fuzz testing uh, within our emulator. For Samsung, we built three harnesses, the LTRC, which is used in 4G, the 4G protocol to do um, radio resource control, it's essentially a big part of the control plane for uh, the initial stages. Uh, GSM session management, which is used in establishing internet uh, connectivity uh, for GSM, and GSM call control, which is used during calls. Uh, for MediaTek, we, uh, for comparison purposes, implemented the LTRC protocol, uh, a harness for that as well, which, as I had mentioned, is using a different vendor plugin and a different mod kit because they're two different architectures. After running fuzzing, we discovered seven unique crashes, four of which we, we, after using the root cause analysis capabilities provided by firmware, we determined were previously unknown. And uh, we started, before we even found the new findings, was to verify an existing one, which was uh, the G a GSM SM bug, uh, which we were able to, which had a previous manual effort to have found. We then used the AFL to automatically find this. And that gave us confidence that we were on the right track and then uh, in developing the other uh, harnesses, we were then able to find two critical vulnerabilities and one high. And these ratings come from Samsung. Additionally, we found one more critical vulnerability in the GSM CC uh, protocol. And by critical, this means it could lead to remote code execution over the air on the target baseband's and or at the very least a denial of service. Uh, there's a lot more detail in the paper, so I encourage you to read it. So uh, with these bugs, uh, we wanted to, before we even submitted to the manufacturer, confirm that they were legitimate. And we did this by replaying the fuzz inputs that FirmWire were able to generate using our fuzzing harnesses and then uh, how AFL was connected to these fuzzing harnesses. We took those inputs that were generated 
And then we modified open source base stations to throw those inputs over the air. Uh, one thing I will note for the cellular people in the room, uh, we were not using any SIM credentials. So what this means is that there was essentially no prerequisites for this attack except being in close proximity. Uh, they're all pre-authentication. So for uh, LTRC, we modified OpenLTE, and we modified for uh, all the three cases that we found, the uh, RC uh, con uh, connection reconfiguration encoder, which would then, instead of sending the normal legitimate standards compliant message, would send our fuzzed uh, ASN1 encoded message. For GSM, we modified Yate BTS, and for the session management protocol, we changed the protocol configuration options encoder, and for CC, we changed the call step encoder and initiated a call towards the target device. And in all cases, the basebands crashed uh, with, with each message. And we could confirm this using logs on our physical devices, so log hat, and uh, we could also see that the signal bars would disappear. So uh, firmware can clearly find bugs, but is it something that's a one-off, or is it scalable from now and into the future? To answer this question, we collected a large corpus of firmware uh, spanning uh, five years of uh, images across multiple devices. Uh, we, de we then deduplicated this firmware because these are um, vendor update images that have more than just uh, the modem uh, updates, the basement updates, and so this left us with 229 unique firmware images. Uh, with this, we, after having created our vendor plugins, we then tried to automatically boot these without any fuzzing, just trying to get them to run and um, uh, be expecting events. And the vast majority were able to do so without any manual intervention. And the 16 remaining uh, were blocked for various reasons, which we go more into the paper. But in summary, there were some issues with the timers and the peripheral return values. And this could be improved in future work by additional modeling and debugging. So in summary, we were able to break down the booting firmware by model, and as you can see, we have a, a, a fairly representative set, uh, at least across the Samsung Galaxy uh, devices. And uh, uh, this, I believe, is pretty dem it demonstrates that firmware is not only scalable across the platforms, models, but also firmware images, which means that uh, we're not encumbered by having uh, the offsets change every time there's an update. We're able to port and not have to require a significant manual effort from analysts. So with all those firmwares that we were able to boot, we then did a large-scale study of the bugs that we had previously found. And uh, this is a timeline with the release dates of the firmware on the bottom, the phone models on the left, and the bugs that we found um, within each phone model. Uh, these little black dots are the firmwares that we tested, and the red color means there was a crash, and a green means there wasn't. So uh, that, that SM bug that we talked about, which was used as a ground truth, we confirmed that it was vulnerable from a certain version backwards, and then we also confirmed that there was no newer version that still had that bug, uh, which is good. So the manufacturer made a correct patch. Uh, one of the bugs we found in CC, we were able to, as you can see here, it was crashing on all phone models that we tested, uh, which demonstrates that this would be a, a pretty severe bug, at least, uh, in the sense that it could affect many phone models, uh, I guess millions of phones. Uh, another interesting case is that the RC bugs we found did not affect the S8. So by the ability of having the more firmware to be able to use for testing, this means that if we hadn't, if we had said just use S8, we would have missed these bugs entirely. And we think the reason this is the case is that the, the stacks between these different models may have changed in a certain way, making the bug less reliably um, uh, crashable or um, exploitable. Uh, one kind of interesting case was when we reported these to Samsung, uh, we discovered that uh, uh, one phone model had received the patch, but this other one, the S9, had not for over a year. And uh, we reported this to them again. As you can see, it turns green just toward the very edge. Uh, but without having been able to do this kind of large-scale analysis, this, this would have been missed. So in summary, uh, Firmware scalability lets us do these kinds of analyses, which gives us unprecedented long-term insight into baseband health and security. So to conclude, uh, we built Firmware, which is the first full system dynamic analysis platform specifically tailored for baseband firmware. Firmware is the first to emulate Samsung's and MediaTek's closed source baseband processors from boot. And using Firmware, we were able to discover four new remote pre-authentication vulnerabilities and trigger them over the air. Now, firmware is also released right now for the community to use, and if you've never used uh, 
done anything with baseBands, we encourage you to try it out because we've made it uh, Dockerized and easy to use. And as you can see, it has received a significant amount of attention already from the community, uh, especially from the industry side. So I uh, really appreciate your time, and thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions.